Well, you might have uh, picked up on that we uh, stole the title of that song that we've been doing for a few weeks and placed it uh, into this message series because it really is our heart and our desire that in 2018, Five Stone would really possess and really demonstrate a reckless love of God where we give ourselves away. And that's what we've been talking about over these last few weeks is how can we, no matter where we are in our relationship with God, maybe you're far from God, maybe you're trying to figure this out, and maybe Christianity doesn't make sense to you, and the Bible is just a book, and and uh, maybe you wouldn't consider yourself a, a Christ follower. We're so glad you're here, and we're so thankful that, that you have an interest in being here and trying to figure out, hey, what is this thing uh, about the love of God, and what is it about Jesus, and is it real? And, and we want to help you take a step in your faith and t- take a step in a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. That's really our desire and our heart. And maybe some of you feel like, man, I'm really close to God, but we want to help you take a next step in your growing relationship with Jesus Christ. So no matter where you are, who you are, we're glad that you're here. And we want you to know that it's our desire at Five Stone that we would really demonstrate to the world a reckless love where we're giving ourselves away where we understand that God is calling us to love more, to serve more, to obey more, to be generous and to invest in people's lives and to make a difference and to see uh, the, the things of God come alive in this world. And so glad that you're a part of that. You know, and what we've been talking about in this series is really how that we might be more like Jesus, how we might really become more like him, whatever he is, he's our master. Those of us who know him and have a relationship with him, we say that he is our Lord, he is our Savior, he's the boss. And to be a disciple simply means that whatever the master is, that's what we want to become. Whatever the master does, that's what we want to do. Whatever the master says, that's what we want to say. Where the master would go, that's where we want to go. And so we want to be more like Jesus. And when we think about the life of Jesus and how he demonstrated this reckless love, how he gave himself away, then that's what we want to be in our life. And last week, we talked about this idea that if we're really going to be more like Jesus, we have to be connected. That there has to be a relationship where we're doing life together. That God never intended you to be a solo Christian. He never intended you to just try to do it on your own and to try to make it on your own. That we need community and we need people pouring into our lives and you need to pour your life into other people. You know, after I preached that message last week and after we talked about it, had group link again so that we could be connected and and do life together because we say, you know, life is better connected. I had two incredible just testimonies of of that this this past week. Uh, Some of you know last week, if you were here, I kind of avoided everybody because the flu had been running through our house. Uh, I was sick. Uh, Our 18-year-old son was sick. My wife was sick. They really had it worse than I did, but, but I really didn't have much interaction and stuff and kind of just kept my distance, and I hope I didn't infect any of you. I, if I did, I beg your forgiveness. So uh, just, just want you to know it wasn't my intention. And, and so as, as you know, I, I said last week I, I was sick, and a few days later in the week um, we got this card at our house, and we opened up the card, And it was from one of the connect groups. And one of the connect groups sent us this card. A lady in the the connect group said, hey, just wanted you to know that our connect group is praying for you and praying for your family that you might get better. You know, to me, that is so powerful. That is such a testimony of the love and the ministry and the things that happen in our church that a connect group would remember to pray for other people and be involved and and care for other folks. And then Friday afternoon, I was doing a, a memorial service. One of our church members had a family member that passed away. And so I was uh, had the privilege to officiate and, and uh, you know, try to minister to that family. And when that was over, we had a, a church member who's been critically ill and hasn't been doing well and was in the hospital. And earlier that morning, our church member had 
had to go undergo a surgery and that surgery was so tenuous and it was so so risky that they were even saying we're not sure that that this person you know has a great chance of you know making it through the surgery and so by the time I could get to the hospital uh, after the memorial service and when I went by there and by the way I, I can't go to the hospital every time and so usually if I show up it's not really good uh, so you know what I mean uh, so uh, anyway that just kind of you know just I went there and when I got there this this is what happened a connect group had been at the hospital all day long from since like five in the morning and I didn't get there till five or so in the afternoon they had been there all day long ministering and praying and being the hands and feet of Jesus to someone who needed it you know to me that's what doing life is all about right life is better connected and when you have those kind of relationships it just makes a difference and so today, we want to help you understand that, that God wants to grow us, and God wants us to make us more like Jesus, and God wants us to have this reckless love. In order to have a reckless love, we have to have a desire uh, or to be more like Jesus. In other words, when we see Him, we want to be like Him. Whatever he did, that's what we want to do. The way he gave himself away, that's what we want to do. And when you dive into, we've been looking at the book of Titus. It's a small little letter that this man, Paul, who was Saul, a persecutor of the church, God changed him and radically made him into this incredible missionary theologian, this, this great writer of so many uh, books of the New Testament. We're looking at, at Paul's letter to Titus and there are two words that really jump out at you in this, this little letter. The letter is only 46 verses long. It only has three chapters, and it's not very uh, long, but it packs such important teaching and such important message to us. And two words really jump out at you uh, when you begin to dig into this book of Titus. Titus was a protege. He was a young minister that Paul was training and, and kind of mentoring and, and leaving uh, him on this island of Crete in order to set things in order to make sure the churches on this island were doing well. And so Paul writes this letter back to Titus and he says, hey, here are the things that are important. Sound teaching and teaching the people to love God and to do works and to, you know, have uh, pastors who are obedient and who teach sound doctrine and, and those things. And so there are two words that I've mentioned before that I want to remind us that are really important for us. The first word is godliness. That when you look in the book of Titus, Paul even says that it is our faith, this, this faith that God has given to us, that moves us and should pursue, uh, cause us to pursue this life of godliness. Well, what in, the word, what in the world does this word mean? Well, it simply means to be more like God. In other words, if you, someone you look and examine their life and say, you know, that's a godly person. It's like saying, when I look at their life, it's almost like I see God in them. That they reflect the ways of God and the thoughts of God and the actions of God. And, and, and they demonstrate this love of God. Godliness is a very, very important thing in our life. Matter of fact, when Paul just right out of the very beginning, look in verse 1, Titus 1.1. 1, 1, he says, for the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth. In other words, what does knowledge of the truth do? It leads us to godliness. The knowledge of the truth will lead us to godliness. And that's what we want to drill down on today. Is that connection is very important. Connection helps us be more like Jesus. But today, we need to understand that if we're going to grow in godliness, if we're going to become more like God, how do we do that? What causes us to be more like God? Because that ought to be our end goal. Whatever Jesus was, that's what we want to be. Whatever Jesus is like, that's what we want to be like. Whatever he did, that's what we want to do. We want to be godly. Well, there's another word that Paul uses, and it's going to be in the verses that we dig into this, this morning. And it's the word that's almost just opposite of godly, godliness, and that is godlessness. When you think about that, now, listen, we don't want to be this. 
We want to be godly. We don't want to be godless. In other words, you don't want anyone looking at your life. You don't want anyone being able to look at you and say, you know, when I look at your life, I, I don't see much of God. I, I, don't, I don't see, you know, you loving people like God loves. I don't see you serving. I don't see you trying to obey. I don't see you trying to, you know, uh, do the things that Jesus would do. Matter of fact, your life kind of looks exactly opposite of what I think God would look like. Now, listen, none of us want to be characterized like, like that, right? I mean, I don't think on the, you know, you come to the end of your life and they're going to write on your marker, you know, hey, this is so-and-so, he lived this date to this date, and here's the word that we're going to describe of him. It's going to be godless. Boy, that would be great, right? No, you don't want that. We want to be godly. We want to be like God. So how in the world do we do that? What is it going to take for us to be godly people? Well, look in chapter 2, verse 11 of Titus. This is really, really important. He says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people and instructing us, this is really important, instructing us to deny what? Godlessness, there's the word, and worldly lust, and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in this present age. In other words, you and I live in 2018. You and I live in this present age. But don't forget that there is more than just your life. There is more than your 80 years, 60 years, 20 years, or however long God is going to give you. There is more. And so here's what he says in verse 13. He says that you and I are waiting for a blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, there is coming a time where if we live long enough, if we do not pass away, if our bodies do not give way and, and we die, that one day Jesus Christ is going to appear again. He is coming back. And that is going to usher in the end times or the, the end days or the eternal state. In other words, folks, you and I cannot live for this life alone, this present age. That you and I have to keep in mind that there is a blessed hope that Jesus Christ is going to come again. And even if we don't live until he comes again, we may die uh, before he comes again. That doesn't mean that it's the end. That there is eternity out there. I want to remind you that you and I are created in the image of God. We are cre created in God's image to live forever. It was his intent. And even though the curse brought separation and the curse brought not only spiritual death but physical death, that God still has made us eternal beings and you are going to live forever somewhere. We want you to be in heaven. We want you to be in the eternal state. We want you to experience the glory of God in the presence of God here in, in uh, the new heaven and the new earth and, and experience all the blessings of God. But we need to understand that if we're just living for this life, man, we're going to step out into eternity and it's going to be a rude awakening because we don't die, we don't cease to exist even though our bodies cease to be alive in the way that we think they are. So what God says is, what it go into verse 14, and look what he says. Jesus gave himself to redeem us from all lawlessness. In other words, not living in accordance to God's law or God's word, but to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession. In other words, when you trust Christ, you, you've been bought with a price. You we're bought with a price, and you're to glorify God now in your life, in your body. And you are God's possession. And he wants you to grow in godliness. He wants you to become like him. And here's what will happen next week if you'll come back. We're going to dive into this idea of doing good works. So here's the way we could look at this. You want to become more like Jesus? You want to grow in godliness? Last week we said you can't do it alone. You need to be connected. 
today we're going to talk about some, some areas in which we need to understand how growth happens in our life, how spiritual growth happens. We want to be connected, we want to grow, and then next Sunday we're going to talk about this idea of serving or going out and doing good works, doing what God has called us to be, to be the hands and the feet of Jesus, to be ambassadors in this world, to represent Him in this world. So the question for us today is simply this, how in the world do we grow in godliness? There's many, many ways you grow as a disciple or a follower of Jesus, but I just want to show you from this passage some things that, that really will, or will be important. If you go back to verse 11, here's what he says. He says, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. I want to remind you that it's the grace that brings us into a relationship with Jesus Christ. That you didn't get into a relationship with God because you earned it or you went to church or you were baptized or you took some class or you did some kind of ritual or incantation or you know you walked down an aisle and said a magic hocus pocus kind of prayer. No, that doesn't make you a child of God. It is the grace of God that has appeared, bringing salvation unto all men. In other words, it is simply us acknowledging that Jesus is Lord, that He is Savior, and we have faith and believe that God raised Him from the dead. And we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead. And by that act of, of faith, the grace of God is imparted to us. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation unto all men. Now listen, salvation simply means that now you're in a right relationship with Jesus Christ. You're no longer separated because of sin. You've been made right, you've been justified because Jesus died in your place. He died for you. He paid your sin debt. You didn't do anything to earn your salvation. It is by grace. The word grace actually means unmerited favor. Grace is what brings us into a relationship with God. Now, that's what makes us a child of God. But did you notice in verse 11? He says that this grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation unto all men. And then the very next word that he uses, it says, instructing us, in verse 12, instructing us to deny uh, uh, lawlessness and to uh, uh, worldly lust. And so here's the deal. What is instructing us? The grace of God that brought you into salvation is the same grace that is instructing you. In other words, the way you grow is through grace. It is the unmerited favor of God. It is the grace that is being poured out upon us that makes us more like Jesus. A lot of us think, well, it's, it's works. I mean, it's, it's, you know, i got to do this, and i got to do this, and i got to do this, and I've got to do this. And if I don't do these things, listen, it is grace that moves us into the desire to do good works. It is grace that causes us to have a desire to do the things that, that bring this process of, here's a big church word, and I want to explain it, sanctification. You have salvation entering into a relationship with Christ, but now you are, need to become more like Christ, and that means that you are growing in this process of becoming more like Jesus. There ought to be things in your life when you enter into a relationship with Christ through this process of sanctification that as God brings grace into your life and as the Holy Spirit ministers and teaches you and grows you and people use are, are there in your life, you're connected with other believers, that this process of sanctification begins to work in our life. And here's the way Paul would describe it in some of his letters. He would say, you were like this, this, this old man. You had this old self. And he says, you need to kind of strip yourself. You need to be removed of some things in your life that aren't pleasing to God, that aren't honoring to God, and you're not walking in godliness. You're living in godlessness. And so what do you do? You, you take off that old man and you put on this 
new man. You, you're starting to put on the attributes. You're starting to put on the heart and the desire of God. It's through the grace of God that He's working in our life, drawing us into this idea of becoming more like Jesus. Grace is what makes us more like Jesus. Grace instructs us. And a lot of times we don't think about it that way. We think, well, grace saved us, and man, I've got to work. No, grace is instructing you. Grace, God's grace, God's grace is being poured out on you. And here's what I want you to remember. This sanctification, this growth, it's a process. You may not, you know, you're not going to be where you want to be today necessarily. Does God sometimes free us and liberate us and remove strongholds and, and reveal sin to us in such a way that, that man, we can just step away from that and, and maybe we can, you know, free ourselves from those things? Those things happen, but sometimes we, what? We grow, what? Day by day in the grace of God, in the knowledge of God. We grow in the grace of God, in the knowledge of God, and we're becoming more like Jesus each and every day as we practice spiritual disciplines, which we'll talk about in just a minute. As we put on this new nature, as we take on this, this idea of Christ, He begins to remove things in our life that are not pleasing to Him. Think about this. When's the last time you sat in the presence of Father? And maybe through the Word, maybe through prayer, maybe through you know even someone else, God in His Holy Spirit and in His grace showed you some things in your life that you could put aside so that you might be more like Jesus than you've ever been before. See, those things aren't negative. Those things aren't bad. When God is growing us in that grace and pouring out in our life and revealing to us things that we need to put, us, put aside and we need to be more like Christ in our actions, in our attitudes, in our thoughts, and in our behavior. So the grace of God is not only what brings us to, to salvation, but it brings us into sanctification. Now, Paul does here mention a negative aspect and we, when he says this, he says that you and I are to deny some, some godlessness in our life. In other words, we, we should have a desire to say, listen, there are some things that I, I don't want to do anymore. I, I don't want to live the way that I used to live. I, I don't want to live in a way that's not pleasing the Father. I don't want to live in a way that, that doesn't honor God. I want my life to represent what God wants me to represent. And so I want to deny godlessness and then he says that you and I ought to be denying worldly lust now for most of us we understand the word lust is like a desire it is it is like you know something that drives us and if you have a lust for something well the question is what is a worldly lust and how do you know if this desire you have is, is something from God or is it something that, that is not from God? In other words, is this really a desire that is holy and pleasing to God or is this a worldly lust? And the word world here needs to be understood in this fashion, that God is saying that there is a system and there is a belief. There is a worldly um, view, a world view. That is not pleasing to me. That is not biblical. That is not lining up with my ordinances, with my heart and my desire for the world. It would be like this. Remember, or some of you may know this scripture. The Apostle John, he um, was one of the followers of Jesus. He wrote uh, the, the Gospel of John, and then he wrote three little letters toward the end of uh, the, the New Testament and also uh, Revelation. But in one of his little letters, he says this, that you and I are not to love the world or the things of the world. Now, isn't that interesting that we're commanded not to love the world or the things in the world? So, yet God says he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. What's the difference? God is saying that he loves the world, he loves all the people in the world, 
And we are commanded not to love the world system the way the world believes and the thought processes of the world that fight against the ways of God. There's a difference. The God, little g, of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving and keeps them from seeing the glory of Christ. So there is a God of this world, of this present age, that is fighting against the things of God. And God says, if you want to be like me, you're going to deny godlessness and you will deny worldly lusts. That's a negative thing. We're to deny those things. But then Paul flips it and he gives us a very positive aspect here when he says you are to live in three dimensions, three ways. Look at this. You're to live sensible, you're to live righteous, and you're to live godly. What in the world do those mean? Well, when we understand this is grace being poured out on us, grace is moving us to live in a sensible way. What in the world does it mean to live sensible? Well, that is how we relate to ourself. In other words, we need to live in such a way that we have a proper view of ourselves. We should not think more highly of ourselves than we should, but we shouldn't think more lowly of ourselves. In other words, we need to think sensibly so that we can relate in, in to ourselves and the world around us. Now think about this. If we're to think sensibly of ourselves, here's what this means. It means, first of all, that I am an imperfect person. But guess what? Through the grace of God, I have been perfectly forgiven. I am imperfect. In other words, I, I don't deserve grace. I, I, there's nothing in me that, that would, would merit and, and you know, be a blessing to God. But God says, listen, you are perfectly forgiven. That is sensible thinking when you're in Christ. I'm imperfect, but perfectly forgiven. I am a broken person. But through the grace of God and through what God has done in my life, guess what he's done? He has made me whole. He has changed me. He has made me a new creation in Christ. The old things are passed away and all things have become new. What was broken, he is restoring. I want to tell you, today, some of you feel broken. Some of you feel like you're not worthy. And I want to tell you, God is in the restoring business. He is in the business of taking broken things and bringing them and making them whole again. That is good news today. Amen. You can be made whole through the grace of God poured out in your life. Imperfect yet perfectly forgiven. Broken yet made whole. And then I am unvalued. There is nothing in me that is worth anything. But in Christ I am invaluable. What are you worth? I'll tell you what you're worth. In Christ you are worth his blood shed for you. You are worth his life given for you. That is reckless love. He gave himself away for you. God wants us to think sensibly about ourselves. Have a right view of ourselves. But what is this word? That we're not only to think sensibly, we're to have sensible you know, thinking, but we're to have righteous thinking. That means how we relate to others. That God, as we do life, if we're living in a righteous way, here's what's going to happen. We're going to understand the ethic and the code and the moral things that God wants us to treat people in the way that we would want to be treated ourselves. That this is all about justice and mercy. The righteousness of God being displayed in and through us. That you and I understand that there is an ethic in which we live by. There is a moral standard in which we live by. It is not by the world standards, but it is by the things of God. It is by the ways of God. And listen, we do not treat people the way that the world would treat people. We don't love people because they love us. We just simply love people because God loves people. And it's not about, man, you got to get yourself right. And if you don't live a certain way, man, don't you step through the doors of, of Five Stone Church. I want to tell you, the doors are wide open for anyone to come and experience the love and the grace of God in this place. 
Because that's how God loves. We're to live sensibly. We're to live righteously. And then he says we're to live in a way that is not only sensible and righteous, but godly. We relate to ourselves in a sensible way. We, we relate in a righteous way to others, but then we relate godly in this way that when we view God, we say, okay, God, man, here's what I understand. The more I know about you, the more I realize I am not like you. The closer you get to God, the more you're going to realize how far you are from him. But that doesn't mean that we're not in pursuit of godliness. In other words, we are in pursuit of holiness. That God commands us to be holy for he is holy. There ought to be a separateness in our life. There ought to be a holiness in our life. There ought to be a demonstration in our life that we are different than the world. Because God is different. Not legalism. Not saying that you got to do certain things to merit, you know, God's favor. But listen, we want to represent God well in this way. And some of us are living in such a way in the world that we're not a very good picture of what God really is. And so we want to put on this sensible thinking toward ourselves, this righteous thinking toward others, and this godly thinking toward God. We want to become more like God. We want to pursue holiness and be what He is. How in the world do we do that? Jerry, you told me a lot of stuff that I need to be doing, but you haven't really helped me at all. I want to help you here. I want to help you think about something the Apostle Paul thinks about when, when he says, listen, some of you work really hard at being the best you can be in this life in a physical dimension. But you may not be thinking about the spiritual dimension as much as you need to. In other words, you and I need to have this pursuit in our life, not only of the physical things. And what Paul says is our spiritual growth should be an important part of our life. That, that you and I, when we think about growing spiritually... We need to allow the grace of God to be working in our life. We need to partner with the grace of God. We need to allow the grace of God to be coming in. Now, how in the world does that happen? In the book of 1 Timothy, Paul was writing to another kind of understudy named Timothy. Chapter 4 and verses 7 and 8, listen to what he says. He says, have nothing to do with pointless and silly myths. Rather, train yourself... In godliness. In other words, godliness is what we want to do. So you have to train yourself in godliness. Some of you are very adept and some of you are very passionate about training yourself physically. And that is important. You've got one body. Treat it well. I mean, you're not going to get another one. I mean, unless this medical stuff keeps going crazy, crazy. I don't know. But, but most likely, none of us are going to live that long to get, a, get another one. So, you know, he's saying, hey, take care of your body. It's the temple of God. He's not knocking physical discipline. He says, but the training of the body has limited benefit. Other, he's not saying it doesn't have benefit. He's saying it has limited benefit. But godliness is beneficial in every way. Think about that. Every way. Since it holds promise for what? The present age. In other words, if you train yourself in godliness, you're going to be better off in this life. Your discipline in godliness is going to make your life better now. It's going to make the life of your family better. It's going to make the life of other people better. It is better for you to train yourself in godliness because it's going to make a difference in this present life. But guess what? There is something to come. It is also going to have benefit in the life to come. Train yourself in godliness. Because it not only holds benefit in this life, but it holds benefit in the next life. In other words, there's something that God says, listen, the way that you live your life here is going to matter in eternity. And you see, folks, we have a very skewed view when we think all we got to do is punch our heaven card and we're going to get to heaven. And when heaven comes, it's all going to be the same. Listen, you are mistaken. Jesus talked about rewards. 
Jesus talked about blessings. Jesus talked about places in the kingdom and doing works for him. Listen, it matters in your life how you live. Don't just think all you need to do is punch your heaven card and get, get you know, salvation in you and you're done. No, you need to grow in godliness because, listen, it's going to matter in this life and it's going to matter in the life to come. Now, here's what you're sitting here thinking. You still haven't told me what to do. So let me help you. Think about these next steps. We need to do some spiritual training, folks. We need to be sure that we're allowing the grace of God and we're partnering with the grace of God in our lives. So what does that look like? Well, first of all, I would say this. Train with some other people. Get connected. You can't do it alone. You need someone to train with. Then also, train on a regular basis. If you think coming to Five Stone and listening to me for 35 minutes plus 22 seconds, <laughs> I'm over time already. <laughs> now you're all looking like, oh, look, look back there. He's got a clock. And that doesn't mean a thing to him. <laughs> anyway, you got to do more than come here, folks. Once a week ain't going to cut it. How many of you eat one meal a week? Come on, that doesn't make sense, right? Daily's best, isn't it? Train yourself in godliness on a daily basis. How do you do that? Got to be in the Word. Read the Bible. Study the Word of God. Show yourself a workman who need not be ashamed, rightly understanding or dividing the Word of God. Pour, let the Word of God pour into you. Read it. Meditate on it. Memorize it. You ought, to, you ought to be storing up the Word of God in you. How's your prayer life? Do you pray? You pray on a daily basis? You, you pray without ceasing? We're going to have a series on prayer in a few weeks, and we're going to dig into that some more about this discipline of prayer and how important it is in our life. And here's another one. You've, you've got to go to the next slide. You've got to learn to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. You see, God's word, you know, God speaks to us through that gentle, still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. And you read the word of God and the Holy Spirit speaks into you. You're going to need to know some things in your life that, listen to me, are not in the general revelation of God. They're not necessarily in Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. You're going to need to know some specific things about your life and the will of God and how the will of God plays out in your life. And I want to tell you, here's what God does. When you train yourself in godliness, you learn how to sit in the presence of God, be still in the presence of God, take in the word of God, and then learn to hear the Holy Spirit when he speaks into your life. Next week, we're going to dig into this more. You will grow in godliness when you serve and when you obey. And so I hope you'll come back next week. We're going to dig into the, that more, serving and obeying. But I want to ask you something. Have you been training physically? Have you been chasing your dream of, of you know, building your retirement, building your portfolio? Have you been chasing your dream of having the great job and being at a certain point in your, in your, in your company? Are you chasing the dream of your hobbies and your passions and your pursuits? Students, are you chasing the dream of trying to get everything just right so you can get in the perfect school, so you can make the grades and do all that? Those things are important, but listen, you've got to train yourself in godliness along with that. We need to be more like Christ. We need to be godly. And so I want to challenge you this week, man, start practicing some of these disciplines. If you're not reading the Word of God, jump in with us and read the Word of God on a daily basis. We have a reading plan for you. If you're not in the devotion, 
the streams in the desert, we, we can help you get in that. Or you find some kind of devotion. If you're not connected to other believers, then get connected because you need other believers to help you grow. If you're not uh, serving and obeying and doing that, we want to help you find a place to serve in this body. But here's the most important thing. You'll never be like Jesus if you're not connected to God through a relationship with him. You can try to work all this out on your own. But remember, it's a work of grace and the spirit of God in your life. And that's your entry point. So if you don't know for sure today that you're a child of God, there's going to be a prayer team here as our worship team comes to close us out with a song. If you can pray with them, you can ask them the question, man, how do I know I'm in a relationship with God? I want to be in a relationship with God. Maybe some of you want to make a commitment and say, listen, I've been neglecting spiritual disciplines and I want to grow in godliness. This prayer team is here to pray with you and they'll follow up with you. They'll minister to you. They'll help you in your, your next steps. Maybe you need to pray for someone else. Maybe there's a burden on your heart that we don't want you to carry out these doors alone. That's why we have this ministry time. We didn't come in here to play church today. We didn't come in here to worry about a time limit. Some of you may be. I care about your spiritual condition. I care about you connecting with the God who loves you and who poured out his life for you. I care about you knowing that there has been a reckless love that has been given for you. That even though you may not feel valued, with Jesus, you are invaluable. There is no price that could be put on your life. You are loved that much. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray in this moment that you might do your work in our life, that you might conform us to the image of Jesus, that we might be more like him than we were before. And Lord, if that means that some people need to come into a relationship with him, Father, would you draw them to yourself right now? Speak into their heart by the Spirit of God. May they hear the Spirit of God, that gentle whisper speaking into them that they can be made valuable. They can be made whole. They can take what is broken and have it restored. They can take where there is unforgiveness and find forgiveness and love and redemption through the power of the cross, through the blood of Jesus, through being changed by, by you, Lord. For those of us who haven't been pursuing you, Father, forgive us. We've been chasing other things in this world. We've been having our eyes and our thoughts and our focus on other things than you. And Father, we pray that you would transform us and you would change us. Do your work. That's why we're here today, Lord, to meet with you, to hear from you, to be transformed by you. So we pray in this ministry time, that you would be glorified, you would be honored. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand to your feet? Our worship team is going to lead us. These folks are here to pray for you today. You come. Don't be ashamed. You step out as the Spirit moves.
excited and thankful that you chose to worship with us this morning. If you have any questions or maybe some next steps, there's going to be some pastors out in the Connection Center. They would love to talk to you. So you'll have a great week, and we'll see you later. Bye.